Hi everyone, Hanchi Steve Kaufman here. Welcome to Hanchi's World. Tonight we're going to continue on with the second part of an interview or conversation, as the case may be, that I had with Hanchi Rick Lentius about four or five months ago. And what we did, we talked about some of the old days, the early days, some of the people we knew. Tonight we're going to change the view of what we're going to talk about by talking about the actual development of karate. We didn't call it martial arts way back when. Called the straight ahead karate. You did karate, you did judo, jujitsu, whatever else was laying around at the time. And it became martial arts, I would imagine, around like in the 70s, the early 70s, middle 70s, something like that. But we didn't call it that, we called it karate. One of the things that is of interest to you, and it should be, is the fact that we essentially, with a handful of others, are the pioneers of karate and, if you will, martial arts on the East Coast and in the New York area since the early 60s. Early Late 60s, 50s. starting 60. Well, no, we started in the early 50s, but we started going to work in uh, around, I guess, 1960, 1961. You know, when we both came back from Okinawa, Japan, as the case may be. Eddie Gross, no longer with us, came back from Korea. And we, we predated just about everybody. Yeah, I'll uh, jump in here for a second. Well, that's there was no, it wasn't called karate, as you said. They used to call it carrot chops or karachi. And they put it as a form of judo. It was a oh, judo right, yeah, chop. Okay, a judo chop. Yeah. And that's right. they never heard of karate when we were when yeah. we first well, started. Well, there were a couple of guys that like had started to promote it, you know. Over uh, in the West Coast, Oshima. Yeah. Okay. And then you had all these other guys out there. Uh, Alan Steen, Joe Corley, uh, yeah, well, uh, Chuck you, Norris. Yeah. Okay. But he wasn't but, even around when we were there. No. No. Not at all. We were watching something before that you brought over and you surprised me. It was an interview that had been done about me or with me by Greg Allen, who is one of the world's foremost honest masters. Right. And uh, we were watching that and I was looking at it. And, and I it was in 1981. 1981, yeah. And like we were talking about things that now are becoming common. Like, you know, the Zen application of the mind, uh, the application of the mind, the Zen and the martial arts, things like that, which really were unheard of until we started talking about it, myself primarily. And with the interview in 1981 was 10 years before the, my version of the Book of Five Rings came out. So therefore, that, you know, you essentially gave all the qualifications that were required to uh, be able to handle that. And then having been elected to the rank by a select group of karate people at the time to the rank and title of Hanchi, okay? So we've been around, we know what's going on. Uh, one of the things that is important to talk about is the difference between what we call first generation and second generation. First generation meant, or, and still does mean, anyone who came back from Asia it was called the Orient. We didn't even call it Asia, man. Where were you? Okinawa. Where were you? Japan. You know, where were you? Korea. Okay. If you came back after having studied in the Orient, you were essentially first generation, and you more or less, because of the lack of senseis or teachers to teach us to take us any further, our styles developed based on what we knew not based on the idea of changing things just to, I guess, look cool, look hip. That, that seems to be like uh, the dominant factor in today's martial arts world. Why don't you talk a little bit about how you first started to open up your first school, and then I'll jump in. I want, I want to keep this going back and forth. I don't want to start getting into, hey, you remember so-and-so, or if we didn't do this, you guys wouldn't do that. Don't want to touch that. We're not going to put anybody down. We're not going to, like, knock anything. But what I am going to do, as the host of Hanchi's World, I am going to commend those of you out there who have disciplined yourselves and studied and devoted yourselves to our native art form, karate. Okay, I use the word karate. I do a little tongue-in-cheek. But we're not here to, like, impress anything. We're here to just tell you the way things worked. Tell us how your whole system and whole style came about. 
So, having said all that, what happened actually was, <laughs> I, uh, I studied in Japan. I studied under Kenjuro Kowanabe, who is direct student at Waseda University of Gichen Funakoshi, the founder of Shotokan Shotokai. I'm actually Shotokai first, Shotokai, Shotokan second, when it became JKA. I was there when Funakoshi passed away. That was in 1957 in April. I actually went to his gravesite the last time I was in Japan. The point is when I came to America, my first landing, I was a Marine, and I landed in, um, well, we were mustered out in, in uh, San Diego, I guess it was. <laughs> and there was a Hard young- Hard to remember things, yeah, huh? Well, I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> At my age, I can't even take yes for an answer. But what had happened in San Diego, there was a young guy who was doing a show in a place called Muscle Beach. And okay, it, it was yeah, just yeah. a little square ring he had. And this guy was really more or less like an actor. And I decided just to go over and take a look at it. Are we talking about Bruce Tegner? No, but I remember Bruce. You remember Bruce? Yeah, yes, I remember okay. for 99 cents you could be a black belt. <laughs> but um, the truth of the matter is this guy was a showman and he was, he was okay. And he was doing something that I started with in 1949, which was Kempo. And this man's name was Ed Parker. And Ed Parker had somebody breaking bricks. And he looked at me, because I was right at the edge of the ring, and he said, do you think you could do that? So I took one of his bricks, threw it up in the air, and cut it in half. And he said to me, when would you get back? I said, just now. <laughs> and that's how I met Ed Parker Sr. I came back to New York City. There was nothing going on. Nothing at all. Everybody called this judo chops in those days. Yeah. There was no karate, which is empty hand. And what had happened was, I, right, went, here we go. Go ahead. I went to a place called Judo Inc., where a guy by the oh. name of Bob Soleil in Jamaica was teaching. The <laughs> thing that happened was, Bob was a judo man, and he was teaching with a book on his table, karate. And he was teaching the first kata in a long line. The first kata is done like the letter H. It's called a hian kata. And I looked at him and I said, I, I don't really think that's the way it works. He says, really, how would you know? I said, I'll show it to you. And he hired me to teach karate there. I stayed there long enough to have a young kid by the name of Malachi Lee, uh -huh. seven foot giant of a black man, studied with me and I promoted him to green belt. The same time a young kid came in who I scared the hell out of because, you know, we were a little bit enthusiastic about our art. And his name was Robert Kamen, and he wrote the movie <laughs> The Karate Kid. The Karate Kid, the mean sensei, the marine in the black uniform, is a takeoff, supposedly, what Robert said to me, of myself and Ed McGrath. He met Ed McGrath because as I was leaving Bob Soleil, Ed McGrath, I interviewed, and he took my place at Judo Inc. I left, and then I was hired by a guy by the name of Jerome Mackey, <laughs> who was a judo guy that used to play the piano and wear a top hat, a little straw. Those are twins, the judo twins. No, the judo twins were on... Um, Madison Avenue. Yeah, but before that, they were on 23rd Street on the second floor, I believe. Uh, one was a mailman, Bernie, yeah. and I forgot his brother's name, but uh, they're still around. And there was a couple of other judo guys, which was Shina and Yanni Unesca. And while teaching there, John Slocum taught there, who had a school called Samurai in Flushing. Anse taught there, and I taught there. And then what had happened is, I started opening up my own dojos. <laughs> Thank you. 
And while opening up my own dojos, I kept hearing throughout, everywhere I went, <laughs> the snake is coming. The snake is coming. And I oh had my no clue. God. I would go to Bay 2 in Brighton Beach, and <laughs> I would be just getting off the beach, and someone would say, the snake was just here. You know, I didn't know what this meant. But <laughs> sure enough, one day I'm teaching my students at 142 Neptune Avenue. Yeah, which was smaller than this living room. No, yeah, it was smaller than this living room, is right. Here, show a picture of this living room. No. So what happened is the door flies open. Wham! Two guys walk in dressed in black, wearing black berets with dark sunglasses. And in walks this tall, thin guy looking like Robert Culp, like a movie actor. I'm not Robert He's, Culp, man. You, you look like from I Spy. And he had a black beret I with a little not, white pom-pom on your top. Get out of here. And he says to me, <laughs> had a cigarette then, and he goes like this. Say, man. Now, I knew it was oh, a come snake. On. Yeah, yeah. Say, you you're, did. you're overdoing it, man. Can I come? You're gonna and, have to cut a lot of this. Can I come and work? Well, she gets with a little insane, you know. So now I knew who the snake was, and he came into my dojo, and he worked out with my people, and I must tell you, <laughs> when he came in and with all the theatrics and everything else, I just couldn't wait to see him leave, but after he did a couple of moves, I was very impressed. I was truly impressed. <laughs> And he was very fast. And up until that time, I didn't know anybody that was faster than me. And you will attest that I had very fast hands. And you always used to say, if you could put Maynard Miner's feet and your hands together, you might have a karate guy there. You were telling me that it would be good. Maynard Miner is a wonderful man, humble guy. And he was one of the few people still, still around. around. Yeah. And he's still around. He's got the same dojo on Saratoga same Avenue. Same place. Or yeah, yep. In Flappish, I think it is. Yeah, all right, whatever. That's the beginning. The beginning, and I must tell everybody this because it's very important. We had only a few people. But the people we had, we didn't have gloves or cups or we did it for real. It was barehanded. And it was full contact. And we bled a lot and we broke bones a lot. And sure enough, Ed Parker comes into Manhattan with his buddies, John Slocum, Peter Urban, a guy named Ray Berkeley from Jerry Mackey, and they formed, they got a meeting at a place called the, the Imperial oh, Dojo the Imperial Dojo out in on Queens. Fifth Avenue. No, it was on Fifth Avenue and 14th Street, down from where Rico okay, lives. Okay, okay, down the street from Rico. Yeah. Incredible place, an incredible place, and they decide they're going to have a tournament in Madison Square Garden. Now, ladies and gentlemen, and all you young Turks, the that was the real Madison Square Garden yeah. before the one that you see today. It was the real Madison Square Garden. So they needed fighters. And they asked me to just come down to watch and see what was going on. Kojuru Karate, line up here. Peter Urban's people, 50 of them lined up. Shonjiru, line up here. Uh, another half of the. Ishinru, Don Eagle's people, Gary Alexander and his whole crowd line up. And then he, and he looks at me and he says to me, eh, what are you doing here? What kind of karate are you? And I said, I'm an American. And he said to me, oh, yeah, American karate. How many guys did you bring down? I said, none. So he said, well, you line up. He said, and he said, so what are you doing here? I said, I'm telling you this. I'm going to bring five people to Madison Square Garden. <laughs> you guys knock yourselves out. And when it's all over, we're going to kick your ass. And they laughed. And he said, what's your name? And I said, Lentius. But... Ed Parker didn't hear me say Lynch's, and he said, legend? And I said, yeah, that's me, the legend. Right. And Peter Urban said to me, don't you know that, no, don't you know, had a high-pitched voice, that legends are dead. All right, let's take a little break over here. I want to talk uh, about you going into Madison Square Garden. 
Yeah. I want them to know who fought there. You're watching Hanchi's World. My special guest is Hanchi Rick Wenches, part two of the fables and fantasies of karate in the New York area, starting in the very early 60s. I mean, you can't get earlier than 1960. So we're going to continue on the conversation. The whole purpose of this is for you folks out there to learn firsthand the history of karate, the history, well, that's what we called it, karate. We didn't call it martial arts. Right. The history of karate and the martial arts in New York, in the East Coast, I guess part of Jersey as well, maybe, yeah. but primarily in New York. And uh, let's continue on a little bit. Uh, what I'd like you to do is talk a little bit about the uh, debacle that occurred at Madison Square Garden in 19, what was it, 61 or 62? 62. And that's where, that's 62, where we 62, that's where everybody got disqualified. Yep. That's correct. <laughs> well, that's all right, correct. Well, 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 we'll let you go into that. Uh, I just want to bring a few things up. Um, my own first school actually started with, what about three or four guys? Jerry uh, Curielli. No, uh, it was Abe before Gore, Jerry. Abe, Big Abe. Big Abe, yeah, right. right. Uh, in Howard Beach. In Howard Beach. And it was in some basement rec room or something like that. Nobody had any idea about what I was doing over there. But we did attract a number of people. And uh, it lasted over there for about seven months, six, seven months, until it became difficult to get out there for whatever reasons. And it just wasn't building up. My second and primary first dojo was on Ocean Parkway and Avenue L in the basement, uh, where we didn't have a Wing Chun dummy. We had a figure painted in black on the wall, and it says, well, the superhead said, you guys can't put up a uh, Makiwata. Boss, that would be putting holes in the wall. So I said, well, can I paint the figure on the wall? He says, paint the figure on the wall. So instead of using a maki wada, we would just hit the cement wall. And we did this. And uh, we got very, very good at it. Uh, Hanchi Gunches was talking about picking up a brick and chopping it in half. I mean, this was just a common everyday occurrence. Absolutely. Um, the one, you know, I couldn't break a coconut. Go figure. I did. Yeah, well, yeah. But, but I want to jump in on you. On, no, I'm not Because done. you could cut me out of this thing. That's right. I want to tell about your dojo, but I want to first finish up with Madison Square Garden. No, well, we've okay, got go Madison Square Garden. That's your show. Go ahead, talk. I'm only you know a guest. Go ahead. Thank you very much. You're good. Uh, we can get along with each other and kid each other like this because we've been in the trenches, so to speak, with each other. For sure. Okay? Uh, I mean, a lot of people say, well, have you ever done anything besides fighting the garden and teaching a couple of dojos and being a couple of tournaments? Yeah, I made my bread with my hands working the uh, picket lines for a couple of uh, strike breaking uh, situations in Brooklyn. I worked on the street with Frank Ruiz. Yeah, that, Frank. You'll tell him who Frank Ruiz yep. is. Um, Great guy. This is all before any of this uh, became popular. And we were desperate, and I want to use the word desperate, to find our identity with this. We would say, what the hell are we, what are we doing here, man? We go around breaking everybody's head. Everybody's breaking everybody else's head. Let's go back to 1960, what was it, November? 62, yep. November of 62 in Madison Square Garden, where there must have been about 200 or 300 karate people from all over the place in the area here. And at that point, I didn't want to represent myself as a school, so I fought under your flag, okay? <gasps> he, he admitted it. <laughs> and what happened was, with all these people, 50, 40, 60, 35, 80, who the hell knows how many guys from all these different schools, we stood there, all six of us. What had happened Okay. they say, I said, we're, I'm going to bring down people, whether it's five or six, okay. and I told them, we'll be there. And we came, and they didn't expect it. They thought it was a joke. They really thought we were a joke. But we came, Johnny Mazzarano, Steve Kaufman, John Cravato, Louis Jerome Beal, Harvey Cohn, and um, John Hickey. John Hickey, yeah, right, man. We came there. I'm the one that took the videos of these guys that Steve didn't talk about on the Arab Bank show. I had the videos. I took it. And you will see everything <laughs> that really went down. But the most impressive thing you'll see, and I'm not knocking my other guys because 
They were wonderful. Harvey was Mr. Technique. These guys were and like Maserano up, man. was so powerful. And they were such class actions. Louis Jerome Beal. But we didn't play. We weren't playing. No, nobody played. But he got out there and he lived the role, and I, whether he likes it or not, of the snake. He stood, he's tall, he's, he was thin, he stood very long, and he used to wave this hand over his head all the time, like a snake with a rattler. Psst, okay? And then from that position, he would, like he was going to spit in your face. But he didn't. He just went that noise. And the guys would go like this, and he'd kick him. He threw a sidekick or something, and then that's when it started. But the winner was Gary, Gary Alexander. Alexander yeah. And he deserved it. He was a great guy. Absolutely. We all broke away from our Japanese roots. And when you said we had nobody to teach us, we taught each other. That's what I that's We what fought I meant. each other. We learned from each other which we didn't have the egos like this. We, the only way to gain rank in those days was you go to another guy's school, you sit there and he said to, would you like to uh, join my school? And we said, no, we'd like to play with you. We'd like to fight and see where we are. That's and right. we learned, we didn't just do our style. Hey, do this. And we, every style, every style. That's why, for example, when I talk about in the Book of Five Rings, it has nothing to do with style. It has to do with the heart of the warrior. Correct. Okay? Correct. And that's as simple as that. And that's what I'm talking about, the spirit of the thing itself. That's okay? correct. That is in you as you through you. Okay, we're going to cut it here. This is not the end. We're going to do a week. We've got to do at least about two or three more shows mm -hmm. to get this whole thing up to date. I want you to know what his dojo was like. It's truly important. I want you to know what my dojo was like back in 1961. It was honest to God. If you walked into his dojo or mine, and we were always in the basement. I was in the basement of Newkirk Avenue, if you remember, he's oh. 16th. We had incense burning, and it was dark. And when we went in there, you, you forgot about the outside. And you could hear, when you were alone, the key eyes and the sweat. And you could feel the spirit. And smell it, man. And smell it in the walls. <laughs> He always goes like this. And that kid always lives. And you being so tight, you become a stick. So your punches, although you think you're strong, you're the push punches. And smash it. So if you don't hold a fist, hold a fist, but hold it loose. So that when you do throw your punch, it will come faster. And then when you strike,
Anchi Lynches, thank you very, very much for coming back on the show. Okay. Thanks for having uh, me. Before you're back for the third time, we're going to show the interview that Greg Allen did with me in 1981. If you get a hold of some of the older guys and listen to them and work out with them, God forbid you learn something and you'll, you'll become something. You get a bar mitzvah. Hachi Glenches, yes, thank sir. you very much for being on Thank the you show. for having me here. Right.